Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to this session of uh, Global Leadership Series uh, Conference number two. This is uh, a part of the pivot summit that we are going to be doing in September, and we are having these preliminary conversations with everybody to a start the discussion early enough so that people uh, understand what is it that we are trying to achieve. Uh, Padmini, can you please put everybody on mute? Yeah. So I would like to welcome you on behalf of Pan IIT to today evening, and thank you very much for taking time out on a Saturday evening uh, around the time when you get to meet your relatives and friends and everybody. Thank you very much. I am Devashish Bhattacharya, General Secretary of Pan IIT, and on behalf of Pan IIT, I'm welcoming you to uh, uh, today's session. We are going to be discussing uh, a topic which is of interest to many people, but we do not really have a clue, which is technology and legal, right? Which we'll get into a bit later. Padmini, can you please put on the presentation? Padmini? Yeah, Devish, I'm just starting the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So, but many the presentation, not the PDF. Silence. Yeah. Okay, so what yeah. I will do is I will just give you an overview. After that, my colleague Pradeep, who is chairing the program, will take over. So I would just like to touch upon a few things. First, about Pan IIT. We are a body representative of all IIT alumni across the world, right? We represent at a very, very conservative estimate about 450,000 alumni from all the IITs. Right, and we have active chapters in multiple countries US, India, UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, Japan, Korea, uh, Middle East being some of the places. Right, our alumni are in top positions in the private and public sector, in civil services, in government, in RD and academia, and they are doing a lot of work which are illustrious, which are renowned. And we have also alumni who have been working on the who are who are entrepreneurs and who are contributing a lot to the startup ecosystem and are leading many, many renowned organizations, right? Pan IIT undertakes impact making initiatives, right? Our underlying objective is nation building. And in all our initiatives, we promote technology, we promote engineering innovations, do dissemination of knowledge, bring academia and industry together, and we use our platform as a showcase for talent and capability of the IITs and the IITMs, right? Our objectives are promotion of the brand IIT, what we stand for, what we can do, what our capabilities are, what we can contribute to. That is one part of what, we, uh, what our objective is. We create relationships with all stakeholders between alumni, government, industry, investors, and the IITs. We bring all IIT alumni together on a common platform so that we can utilize the reach and the number of alumni, their capabilities, their resources to promote all their achievements, create opportunities for the alumni and various stakeholders to engage with each other and bring more and more stakeholders to the platform and in the process, create a meeting ground create visibility for IIT startups, IIT incubators, and in the process, underlying objective is to contribute back to the nation which we belong to, right? So each event of our Pan-IIT platform, every activity that we do 
allows us to expand our interaction, create impact, and increase our circle of stakeholders. Topic which, which we belong, right? So each event of our Pan IIT platform, every activity that we do, allows us to expand our interaction, create impact, and increase our circle of stakeholders. Can we can we can we have everybody's yeah mobile right. the thing being switched off? Of our Pan IIT platform. Patmini, I'm listening to somebody else playing my recording. Okay. Now, what is Pan IIT World of Technology? Pan IIT World of Technology is an ongoing initiative of Pan IIT where we are going to be doing programs and events on technology, on engineering innovation, and uh, identify outcomes out of those events and take them uh, for implementation. <clears throat> From the summit, which is a part of our Pan IIT world of technology, we intend to create outcomes in the form of ideas, uh, curriculum suggestions, applicability to India, go to market, and, and all those things. So we have invited professionals like you, contributors, leading thinkers, IITNs, right, IITs and their faculty and students, industry and investors to all come together and contribute to all of them and, and, and create these outcomes. <clears throat> Right, and this this particular uh, summit that we are doing this year is being organized as a collaboration between four bodies of IIT alumni from Australia, from India, UK, and US alumni bodies. Right, with that, I hand over to Pradeep, who is the uh, uh, program chair and the chair for the startup. He will take you through uh, the summit, and then we will get into the panel uh, discussion, which is what we are eagerly waiting for. Over to you, Pradeep. And when you let me know next, I will change the slide. Yep, next. Done, can you see that? Uh, Pradeep, you're not audible. Yeah, I can see that, but presentation is... Uh... Yeah, right. So welcome all. And I think uh, it's a happy moment for India as we start this uh, uh, discussion today with the first gold coming in for India for a long, long time. So welcome and welcome to this uh, Pan IT Global Virtual Summit, uh, a little brief description that I will uh, take you through. Uh, we, we have this on 17th and 18th of September and uh, it has three main pillars, as you see, one around the conference, which will be looking at inspiring conversations. Second is where we look at applicability of the challenges that people have uh, submitted and what we find relevant from government perspective also. And the third is uh, the startup where we are looking at innovation and uh, disruption of uh, uh, the way the business is done. Supporting this are uh, the, the networking and collaboration sessions. And uh, this all event is then for seek focusing on students, academia, government, corporate startups and investors. As you would see that we have sufficient uh, stuff for each of them. And, uh, but not to leave the evenings and the general discussions, we have the fireside chats and entertainment. And uh, we also have a discussion on the brave new world, which is um, a popular talk show coming in between uh, these things. Yeah, next. So as you would see, as we evolved, so it is 20% uh, uh, years of voluntary effort coming from all the volunteers. And I thank here the volunteers who have put in time so far and they have another 45 days strong run to go. Um, and, and we are talking about people starting from uh, far east, Australia, Japan, Singapore, coming to India, then we go to Israel, UK, and US, all people coming together. And uh, we're trying to bring relevance, knowledge to create a strong impact. So the session would cover uh, roughly 36 hours of uh, discussions and action over five tracks where people will share the, the knowledge and they would debate on the topics. There is some amount of future gazing because we want to know what it's likely to be as things evolve. And uh, each topic and session will bring out uh, curricula inputs. 
Yep, next. So how it evolves is um, as we look at world of technology being the gateway of future. So we have this uh, num number of topics that we discussed and we, we talk to various uh, technology people. We talk to the IITs, we talk to CIOs, we talk to NASCOM and various members. And we have now clubbed uh, what we see is uh, the specific themes under which the topics are uh, done. So magic of AI, as we know, the AI is uh, on a high growth and high mind share, which almost results in almost $800 billion of uh, business potential. We have smart and secure, which is talking about uh, the smart contracts, Bitcoin and cybersecurity. Health is wealth. We, we are aware what are the specific challenge in health given the COVID situation, but much more from health infrastructure and more. We will look also at Automate It All, which talks about automation right from the supply chain to the business process. Powering cloud, as we see today's conferences over the cloud and we are going virtual. So everything happening now um, over the web. And so the business is changing. The way we do business is changing and going virtual. So the way we have now organized this is uh, we start actually early morning because uh, Australia will start early and that would be 5 a.m. India time, but uh, the formal opening will happen at uh, 9 a.m. India time. And then we have broken into five tracks. So three tracks on conversation, which you see what we call the inspire tracks. And then there are two more tracks, one on hackathon and one on startup. And this is the day one where we have this sessions and it goes later late into the night with uh, the the evening uh, thing and finally the unconference to the middle of the night the day two um, starts with uh, a recap for the day one and then we continue these three tracks for the first half of the day and here again early morning we will start with uh, uh, our us track and us will come and then we have our india sessions and uh, here in the second half, then we are talking about the social development goals and the impact. We also bring you the directors and we're talking about things around uh, the moving global actually, and also the curricula uh, initiatives, their thoughts on way forward. And then as we will move towards the, the final session, we will have the awards for the startups and hackathon, a concluding note and the wrap up of the event. So a little more deep dive into what we are really talking about. So when we go into each of these topics, we looked at what they essentially stand for, which can bring out the best. And therefore we are looking at the keynotes and the speakers who are the top experts in each of these areas. And uh, for example, in AI, we talk about detection. And when we say detection, it could start from uh, a visual detection and it could go for a material analysis and, uh, and, and therefore the, the width of the AI will be explored, but focusing on the power of detection that AI brings. Similarly, as you do into multiple processing, we looked at neural networks or when we have to predict and come with uh, real time conclusions quickly, we're looking at mastering prediction using of AI. The other area which we know are, is moving hot and is IoT and we are also talking about industrial IoT the real-time monitoring and predictions coming out from the integrated machine and uh, inputs coming out from there. So similarly, we look at uh, smart secure, we talk about Bitcoins and payments, uh, identity and access, which is an important part now as we go more and more um, on uh, a virtual frame, um, identity becomes important for all transactions and then followed quickly by the cybersecurity. But cybersecurity is not only limited to the software and data, but as we see the systems, and you will look at examples, whether it's Mumbai or, or the or US, we have challenges in cybersecurity as we uh, look at the technology evolving. Health is wealth. We look at drug discovery, um, low cost medical devices, looking at how to improve diagnostics and a real work on the critical care and there are people who are really looking at how the critical care will be spread out. So as I talk, there are three key 
outcomes we are expecting from this um, summit. One is, of course, for each topic as you look, what is the big idea that one can take away? It could be for a startup, it could be for building a business, and there is substantial potential as we see in each of these areas. The second is what is the relevance for India as we see? So in each case, we're looking at uh, these topics, how relevant are they for India? Are they five years ahead or are we already there? And third is what can we look at from a talent and a skill development and therefore curricula to input, inputs to curriculum. So these are some of the things that uh, all the, the panels and the, the discussions will come out to. The next three, the supply chain, as I mentioned, the, the lot of improvement in supply chain happening and you see most of the unicorns in this uh, last quarter have been around the supply chain. So there is a big, big business coming in. Automated all is almost a trillion dollar uh, market size. And within that you have the process automation which takes you within the factory, the mo moving uh, items that help in automation, robots and drones. And of course, the business process that enables the robotic process automation. So each of these then is a ma massive business opportunity. And we see that they are very large on the growth path. So both, uh, both uh, health is wealth and automated all are um, more than a trillion dollar opportunities. Powering Cloud looks at uh, infra, the the redundancy which is required and we talk about the uninterrupted power supply if you look at india the 5g development and uh, the usages of that and then the silicon uh, changes and uh, developments and chips that are happening similarly human machine interface and we talk about ar vr from a going virtual perspective and we see in multiple uh, uh, places application already started and then we bring you Zoo, which is zero operator and ownership, which you look at no operator and no ownership and how the mobility is going to transform. Business models will change. And finally, over operating remote, whether it's education, health, or day-to-day uh, -day work. So things are evolving. So global trial track goes much more deeper in number of use cases, as you will see. We look at product design and capability from UK but there may be some more things evolving there. Similarly, US, we're looking at the new age computing and the cutting edge technologies. So quantum computing, we had one session, but more and we know much more is to come in quantum computing side. We look at space and autonomy and uh, electric vehicle and fuel cell and additive manufacturing. So, so these are some of the key uh, cutting edge or new things that must evolve when we see things happening. Similarly, from Japan, we bring circular economy and precision manufacturing. And from Australia, we have mining and elderly care, which is coming up. And certain things from Singapore, which is uh, the normal uh, uh, growth path in Singapore around the blockchain and IoT. They also look at asset traceability and AI automation. A, a brief preview on startup showcase, uh, we have two location in which the startup pitching will happen. One is India and one is US. So US will have be pretty early in the time. And so we have uh, uh, early stage and pre-series in US, but in India we have pre-series and uh, early stage, but also pitching to business, a B2B pitching and, uh, and also pitch by social impact. So roughly 60 potential pitches. And therefore we have a very large number of potential uh, people coming in and uh, many people around the world are looking at opportunities uh, to invest in the startups coming from the IIT or the people who will be pitching here. And, uh, and running on the, the global leaderships, we are on 7th August, Tech for Legal and Legal for Tech, but we have some more coming up uh, from Australia on 21st August, Digitizing and Technology Initiatives. And uh, the fourth one will uh, be announced uh, uh, in some time. So as you see, we start from Australia, we do, we call follow the sun as we know from global delivery model in India and go to Southeast, Euro and US and we final sessions in India. Okay, next. Can you please mute everybody? I'm <laughs> not
So um, a look at what's uh, the areas where you can participate. You can still nominate speaker, uh, participate in various aspects of the conference. Next. So we have our sponsors. We'd like to thank them. And uh, still the, there is room for more. Title sponsor being Motwani Jadeja Foundation. And we have support from STT, Vertiv, and Ease My Trip. But also thank IIT startups. Uh, and Monishi is here with us today. Hacker Earth, We Contracts, Alma Shine, Cyber Media, Thai, and Decide Up. So, so this is all what I have. And with this, I would like to open the main session and welcome the, the um, panel with introduction of the moderator. And I would then let him take over the main part of today legal for tech and tech for legal. So uh, please welcome Lokendra Tomar, who's our moderator. He's founder Elevate Services, a hundred million dollar plus startup. He has had 20 years of experience in building, growing and ma managing technology ventures. And uh, before this, he was global CEO and head of corporate strategy for HP and fund manager at UTI where he managed more than a billion dollar fund. And he is very well educated if I see his uh, qualifications. Um, IIT, then I am and Harvard. So please welcome Lokendra to take over the session. Lokendra, over to you. Thank you, Pudeep, very kind words. Um, this is a um, very, um, uh, important session. Uh, I think sometime often overlooked the aspect of when we look at, when we talk about technology and we're gonna think a lot of people who probably are not from either of the world may be wondering what is the technology and legal actually have to do with each other. But as we go through the session, I think um, we'll realize how, how it actually has affects our um, our day-to-day -day life, uh, personal life, as well as uh, what we do in our companies. And that is, um, that is, uh, there are very, very important issues uh, and how they impact. And we've got a very good panel here today to talk about um, both the issues. One part of the session will be on what is the, how is the legal system currently and is likely to evolve for dealing with innovation happening in technology. Um, and uh, by nature, uh, technology is obviously, if you're looking for uh, transformational, uh, disrupts what is currently happening uh, and, and so that is the nature of the technology and uh, innovation. And by its very nature, law tend to be very conservative, sets on precedence, uh, and then sort of, you know, need, need, uh, need proofs and, and logic and all of that. So there is a, that inherent DNA, uh, as you should say, it, conflict between the law and tech. But we, we, we actually work in a society which need to be regulated uh, and we need to have innovation. So how do you really balance that these two is the first theme of the session. Uh, the second theme of the session really will be, okay, how can technology actually help uh, in evolving uh, the legal system itself and actually better delivery of the justice system uh, uh, and legal to people in general uh, and also corporations? And what are the innovations which are currently happening and are likely to happen, should happen in this area for, uh, for us uh, to really align um, uh, and technology to help uh, evolve, um, evolve uh, part of legal. And it's not specific to India, and I think it's, it's relevant. It's a global issue. Both the issues are very global issues. Uh, and we have, a, we have a panel which actually has experience in, um, in these areas globally. Now, our first panelist is Ajit. Uh, I, think, I think we all know Ajit Palakrishnan. He was, um, he pioneered uh, sort of the, 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 the start of internet in India with, with, with Rediff. And as an entrepreneur, uh, he, uh, he would have seen and faced early challenges and actually he was trying to launch a new age business, uh, which was a global business, you know, it had operations in US and India um, and about how to deal with the challenges which, which a typical legal or, or sort of traditional legal system would throw up. And we'll actually benefit from Ajit's, uh, Ajit's experience uh, in that. More importantly, Ajit actually has ideas um, on what the current status of technology in legal is and what are the areas in which uh, we can, uh, we can the, the engineers or, or you know, entrepreneurs actually can build, uh, build, build technology to help legal. And we will start with a brief uh, presentation from Ajit. Our other panelist, um, 
is uh, Deepika. Deepika is currently in Chicago. She's pursuing her LLM uh, from uh, California. But more importantly, she's that rare breed of uh, people who's a lawyer as an MBA and MBA combined. You don't see that combination. And I think her perspective on having worked as a corporate lawyer uh, in large global corporations, uh, both in consumer space like Unilever or insurance companies um, like Aviva or AIG, and then actually having worked as an internal legal uh, department ranging across a range of issues which a large global corporation deals with. And she's been an entrepreneur herself. So I think she actually will bring a unique perspective which will combine both, both the understanding of the law globally as well as how an entrepreneur actually uh, feels like when they are dealing with this and what kind of innovation can take place. So we'll hear from Deepika as well. And uh, then we have Vikrant. Uh, Vikrant is an award-winning uh, lawyer um, with DSK Legal. He was, he was identified as part of uh, Lawyer 500 uh, in Asia, and he is a known expert on a number of issues, including cybersecurity and everything, and we actually will benefit from Vikrant's perspective on what the current legal system is, how it should evolve to deal with the challenges uh, or, or the opportunities offered, um, uh, offered um, by, uh, uh, by changes in law and by technology. We will, uh, I will actually invite now for Ajit to, to kind of share his, uh, his views and presentation. We'll begin with that. So that will actually set a good framework for the us to start getting into the issues which I talked about. And towards the end of the session, we'll have questions from the audience. So Ajit, if you want to start, if you would start. Yes, with, yes. thank you, thank you. You can hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can hear okay. you. So somebody is putting up my slides, I think. Yes, Padmini, can you please do that? Okay. See, I'm trying to go and explain in nine slides, not more than that, I promise you, on what uh, what, what does the landscape currently look like. Next slide. You know, here are some snapshots of what's going on. Uh, the, the news uh, hyping up in volume about tech and legal is rising every day as we speak. On the left side, uh, there's, uh, there's, I just cut and pasted it last week. It is technology seem to be the winning edge for law firms, okay, using legal analytics and so on. On top of it, there's an Indian, in India, Indian Society of Artificial Intelligence Law already at work, okay. Now, the Chief Justice of India very recently launched an AI-driven research portal, and there's a lot of interesting work with the judges of the Supreme Court themselves are encouraging. It is far from what everyone's imagination. They are not obstacles at all. They are the ones who are pushing it the most. Uh, uh, people like Justice Chandrasekhar, you know, as I'll point out later, leading the effort to make data available for. Uh, I never use the word AI because, as a practitioner, I think it's over oversell. I use the word deep learning to mean. So forgive me for that. Uh, so similarly, there are, oops, what's that? Yeah. Um, everybody, can, other than Ajit, can go on mute, please. Go ahead, Ajit. Okay. Okay. So there are, you know, there are these little cartoon-like things that we see of uh, uh, of uh, robots sitting as jury members. All that is, of course, exaggeration. And even there are very well. You walk your dog really means that there are artificial intelligence shifters, which helps you speed up the contract renewal, etc. So all kinds of talk is going on around this. Uh, next, please. Now, looking back to how internet has penetrated through, penetrated through media and finance, which is already done by now quite deeply, uh, we learned from McKinsey something very important, that the way what internet uh, and the internet and the web is working is through three different patterns. One is disintermediation. That has been a long chain of dealers and distributors. The consumer reaches directly to the principal. This aggregation, which we are now seeing it, you know, earlier newspapers used to have matrimonial ads and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now matrimonial is a business by itself and news is a business by itself. Similarly, we say in the, in the finance tech region, Payment banks are separating out. So the aggregated bank of old is now getting split up into two or three or five or 10. And finally, dematerialization, which is what used to be paper or film, uh, et cetera, et cetera, now converting into uh, to online 
uh, stuff. So these this, this intermediation, this aggregation and dematerialization is working its way through. For example, in consumer retail, this intermediation has happened almost completely. In automobile and mobility, at, at the moment, a lot of dematerialization is attempting. In healthcare, again, immediately dematerialization is going on, disaggregation is going on, and freight and logistics. Yeah, so all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Sort of already. Next, 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 next slide. Uh, you know, I've just, uh, there's a very interesting uh, case study which people, my purpose of all this presentation is to excite people to get into this area and, and deliver things. This one paper, all of you must read, uh, but what is, what they try to predict the behavior of Supreme Court of the United States, this is done in 2017, and I've given the full re reference to the journal article. It, it's very interesting to see what the uh, variables are, which I, I'm sure you're all from a tech background, you understand where, you know, all kind of regression models are tried. There are, de you know, output variables, uh, you know, the dependent variables and there are independent variables. But what came out in this study is among, even in the United States, the left right political orientation of judges has a big impact <laughs> on what kind of judgments they make. So this is very interesting. I will leave you when you have time to have a look at this Download, it's available for free download. Now, next. Yeah, in, uh, what, unlike other types when, you know, in, in, in the media and finance, when the internet penetrated, the current players were trying to uh, put every possible obstacle in the way. Uh, in the judicial area where things are just starting, our current Supreme Court justices, many of them, particularly uh, Chandra, Justice Chandra Chud, are leading the effort. Uh, I will point all aspirant experimenters to look up the Indian India's national judicial data grid. There's a massive amount of freely downloadable data on every possible case which has been done. And you can see uh, one summary we took there. There are cases pending from 20 to 30 years. In the civil cases, it is, uh, you know, there are 116,000 cases pending for more than 20 years. Uh, and there's 371,000 cases, uh, you know, in the criminal area. So, they, and as I said, unlike others, the current justices, many of them are making an effort to make this data available to all of us who can experiment and use all the algorithms that we know. So I, this is a very, the national judicial data grid is a very important source of data. No? Next, next slide. Okay, now there are, I, I'm just listing some of the current India-based initiatives going on. The, the, when Bob Day as Chief Justice in April, uh, he released a, you know, released a paper using how, spitting out the use of AI in Indian justice. Uh, the IIT Kanpur people are doing a lot of very good work in this. Arnab Bhattacharya, uh, I think, is the lead, taking the leader. So they have done many, many papers and of course they have provided some conferences as well. Okay, uh, there is another, I mentioned these guys to the left, Artificial Intelligence for Legal Assistance, AI LA 2020. There are uh, in individual companies called Legal Craft, Spot Draft, Case Mine, Emleap, etc. All of them are doing pretty good work in this area. So that, you know, it is slowly as we were all looking in other directions and and worrying and bleating about delays in courts. There are a number of people are working in, in the direction of improving things. So I just thought I'd give a reference so you can follow it up. Next, next slide. Yeah, this is a very important slide for me. You know, when word to vec the algorithm was announced, uh, it was seen as a major breakthrough because the key idea there was you could arithmetically deal with words like you earlier could deal only with numbers. For example, you typed king and then put a minus sign and man uh, and then put woman. Basically, you're subtracting the man part of king and adding the woman part and, it, and the algorithm would spit out queen. It was seen to be a very major breakthrough and it was done by using word vectors and the full uh, description is below. But what we all discovered to our horror 
is that if you put doctor and put minus man and plus woman, it's spitting out a nurse. Okay, it doesn't say lady doctor, it says nurse. So it was a very important wake up call for all of us playing around in this area that, you know, the word to wake algo and many of these things are dependent on past data. And past data does go and encapsulate all the biases that we have had in the past. Okay, so while it gets king minus man plus woman equals queen right, it, it all the biases of doctor minus man plus woman is spitting out nurse. So even when you do uh, word to wake type algorithms, as many of you are starting to do in the legal judicial area, you must make sure that you know the the past uh, prejudices which are embedded in, in those jury decisions will get embedded into the future. So there is a great amount of um, hue and cry within you know, the tech circles that I, I hang out with, you know, people who do Python machine learning and algorithms of that kind, where how do we now make an effort to make sure what's a good idea, what makes an excellent idea, is not destroyed by its hidden prejudices. So this is a very important uh, lesson for everyone to, to learn. I've given, again, I've given, uh, you know, the, the full text, the, the reference so you can download the journal. Next, please. Okay, this, I think that many of you know this, Gartner, the consulting company, created this called the hype cycle, where typically, as you know, there's a technology trigger, then it reaches a piece of inflated expectations, a lot of hype, then there's an overnight fall, and this happened back in the 80s when I, a group of us were building personal computers. My partners were two Stanford uh, computer science grads in Bangalore, we had built it and you could see the peak of inflated expectation. Everyone thought PCs will take over in, in 1985, but then it crashed and burned. Then we thought, oh God, nothing will work on PCs. Then a, a slope of enlightenment. So typically uh, technology use in the judicial system uh, is now rising in visibility and it is ascending the hype. Okay, so we have to be all uh, gray haired people must be very calm and make sure that we you know, gently steer it through the peak of inflated expectations and not let it sink too deep into the trough of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. So I think the hype cycle must be watched out for. Next. Yeah, this is my last slide. Uh, on the extreme right, of course, I'm plugging, very subtly trying to plug my own book on it, but you're going to ignore that. But I think there are things, uh, uh, this book, the one at the left, AI for Lawyers, is an interesting thing, an effort, uh, which kind of tends to balance the legal person's point of view with, uh, uh, with the algorithm, algorithm, algorithmist's point of view. Um, the, the one, two in the middle, I think, must be all high to all of you, but I think they are very deep, uh, uh, no hype uh, books, which I think particularly if introduced into the IIT curriculum will do. The third, of course, is The Wave Rider, the book that I wrote myself. Okay, I'm done now. Any questions before I go? We'll open it up for question, Ajit, later, uh, but thank you for you know sharing your perspective. Um, Okay. Um, once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, and I kind of like your optimism and enthusiasm about how you see the opportunities, you know, within this field, which, as Thank you rightly you. say, is rife for. Uh, you can use the word, although the tech, you know, disruption, innovation, there is, there is broader opportunity available here, and it's a huge market. Um, if you one were to look at uh, the how much spend happen in the legal world globally, it touches almost a trillion dollar. U.S. alone itself is between six hundred to eight hundred billion dollar market. And then the rest of the world comes in. So there is the opportunity size here with regard to change in innovation disruption for technology is huge. Um, and it'll keep happening for a period of time, right? For kind of many, many um, years to come. So it's kind of, you're right, you're in the early stages of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the Gartner cycle here. Um, and there, there are a lot of many opportunities. So th thank you, Ajit. We'll get into a bit of a discussion on, uh, on the legal for tech, which is essentially, okay, what is the legal framework because a technology, as, um, as it evolves, is always futuristic. It's always changing the status quo. It's always you know, trying to disrupt something. And legal by nature is uh, it's always looking for what happened in the past, precedents, set rules, 
Um, sometimes they are not actually able to anticipate, uh, not sometimes, a lot of times, uh, and there are probably technology, whatever it tried to change something is, is in conflict with the existing rules of law or legal system. Or, or, so how, when, when you actually, uh, and let's start with your experience first, Ajit, because you actually when I started that in, um, uh, read if um, uh, way back um, when internet was just you know um, uh, in our, in that state of you know early hype, what was your entrepreneur experience in uh, what kind of legal challenges did you face or did you was it a smooth riding for you from the from the legal perspective or did you actually face challenges when you were starting that if? Is the question to me or someone else? Yes, to you, to you. What were the legal challenges? You know, if you're an entrepreneur like I am out of I am Calcutta, I worked three months and then started something on my own. Okay, you don't think of legal challenges at that time. You know, uh, you feel that you can take any, any obstacle which comes, you will jump over it. That, that's a youthful optimism. Uh, but I think today, I, I in India, we have a few, you know, this is not from the early days, but currently, we have a few challenges. India's competition law needs a little bit of adjustment to make sure that it is, uh, you know, as I wrote an article which made me, um, you know, a very unpopular among my legal friends. I said in India, in the competition law, we are trying to regulate using football rules, cricket matches. You know, you, when, you, when, we, when I was in school, you know, we were all playing ardent football players in the Malabar Railway of Kerala. And suddenly cricket appeared. And then you said, my God, in this game, we, you can't touch, you can't kick a ball. How will you play this game? You know, where I say <laughs> in the football area, you can't touch a ball. So I, I think what the current competition law throughout the world and as well as in India is trying to regulate, you know, network uh, industries like the internet. It is somewhat like what they're doing. You know, take the rules of football and run a cricket match. So I think um, that got a lot of uh, laughs. But anyway, I think we have that as one as a challenge, okay? And, and also we have another very important breakthrough which we got was the LLP, Limited Liability Partnership Firms were introduced into India. But what we have not done is that the losses of the startup firm can't be set off against the taxes of the partners of the LLP. You know, the per whole purpose why LLPs took off in the United States at such big level and elsewhere in the world is because I can put in, let's say, um, 50 lakhs of my personal fund into a, a, a legal tech startup, for example. And at the end of the year, first year, and that's, let's say, for example, 30% of the stake. At the end of the year, they make a loss of, let's say, 50 lakhs. I can set off, uh, you know, on my current income, uh, one third of that 50 lakhs I put in. So that little thing is evading us still. The limited partnership firms exist. Now, these are just two examples, competition law and limited partnership. But I think we need, uh, these are the two big ones. Yep. We, need, we need a genuinely Indian internet uh, venture capital fund. You can have, you know, little foreign boys coming and playing with our startup states. Now, because they, they, their goal is to, at the end, go and sell it to Facebook and Google and make them even bigger than ever. So I think uh, this is just two suggestions. I'm sure you guys can think many more. Sure, sure. Let me bring Vikrant into, into this discussion because we talk about the law, uh, ex current existing law and uh, how uh, they need to change. Vikrant, what is your uh, your view on um, sort of this inherent conflict between the legal system and a new technology startup and innovation which need to happen? What, what... <laughs> Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me, firstly. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be associated with uh, IIT in India and worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you have to understand that in India, we are over a billion people. We have nearly 15,000 courts of which there are around 2,500 court complexes spread across the length and breadth of the country. We have 28 languages, multiplicity of uh, different cultures. And the, the challenge before the courts and the systems today is not just the pendency, but also ensuring that 
a fair justice system is created because there is there is a gap there is an access like recently i think the supreme court judge uh, you know one of the supreme court judges stated that there was an access issue with with respect to getting access to justice also now the government has been trying to the government and the judiciary together they are trying to uh, work around the system now e justice is one of the ventures which in the last at least though it started in the 1990s but in the last 5 7 years has really picked up and i think in the last 2 years because of the pandemic last one year because of the pandemic has actually evolved, has actually moved i would say at least 50 steps faster than what we were assuming because what has happened is uh, lawyers as such have preconceived notions they are very stubborn they were very stubborn to adopting technology to uh, to uh, to resolving issues but now what has happened is that with the uh, with the with this pandemic and the lockdown i think the way uh, you know as ajit was telling you know the way supreme court has led it and also the other judges across the length and breadth of the country wherever the bandwidth was permitting have really done an extraordinary job and it's it's no easy task but they have really done an extraordinary job to keep the justice system going of course there are a lot of challenges and a lot of issues which need to be resolved but uh, the government has by recognizing e justice as a as an organ of e governance has put a lot of onus on ensuring that the justice system gets updated and technology becomes a vehicle by which uh, the the challenges and the issues that are there get transcended now the you know the government has launched this e governance plan uh, something called as uh, mission mode uh, project it was i think launched many years ago but the main scope of that was to computerize the system was to ensure that the corruption and the inefficiency in the system the lethargy in the system gets cut down and what has happened is that today we have a system of getting matters listed we have a system of getting access to orders we have a system of creating uh, file dockets and file management of the papers and that has uh, that has come online and that has actually accelerated the process a lot of course a lot needs to be done whenever i'm saying that but i'm also saying that uh, a lot is being done and uh, it's a matter of i think uh, uh, you know one thing that i can take away from the pandemic in the last one year is that we uh, that uh, that that inherent stubbornness which was there that has gone away and there is a lot of excitement now in involving technology today we are having at least in bombay high court and delhi bangalore alabad high court we are we are have, having hybrid hearings so there are part of the council team is present in the court and making the submissions a part of the team is online and they are they are open to such sessions and everybody is open to it the lawyers are open to it the senior counsels are open to it the clients are open to it and that has really helped move a lot of matters faster and i think uh, uh, the challenge will be to uh, to have a system where we can uh, we can have uh, accessibility in terms of uh, in terms of the bandwidth and in terms of uh, you know in terms of adopting this system to all the 15000 courts or at least a large large part of it and to the 2500 court complexes that we have i think once that system you know if you can even touch 30 40% of that which i think by 2025 as justice uh, chandrachur has been talking about by uh, you know probably 2025 we should come somewhere near that figure out it might you know uh, i think that will really transform the you know that will really transform the entire eco the, the entire legal ecosystem in india vis a vis uh, you know giving uh, justice giving access to justice uh, to people and i think that is uh, something that uh, that everybody today uh, in the last one year has come to realize is something that is attainable and that mind shift uh, that mindset change is something which uh, i think is really going to is uh, really going to help uh, you know everyone uh, move ahead and uh, you know deliver what is required thank you vikrant i think you rightly said that that this pandemic has been an enabler uh, accelerated the adoption faster than uh, than it would have taken in general the term and that has been true not only for this aspect of life i think in everything almost everything in our life has 
accelerated significantly going ahead five to 10 years um, in future as only all of you are forced to adopt to the new realities of how do we work virtually. And I think it's been a, in general, just like it is happening hybrid model in every aspect of our life, whether it's going to be education or work, I think the legal system itself will, um, will start to evolve um, towards a hybrid model. It's a good start. And as you rightly said, actually, it, but, but it, it is such a huge system we have. As an example, India is just an example uh, of change in legal that even that start is going to take many, many years uh, to really have a significant impact on the larger population. And we should continue to drive that in the future. Uh, uh, I, uh, let me actually bring in our, uh, our sort of next, uh, uh, next uh, speaker on this. Deepika, Deepika, you, you worked um, uh, with multinational corporations. You actually uh, uh, have dealt both uh, as a buyer of legal services, as well as being a lawyer. Um, uh, and you would have come across multiple sort of, you know, uh, situations uh, with regard to how the evolution of technology and, and the currently existing legal system globally in, in India are sort of in conflict with each other. Um, and uh, what what is your perspective on on that? Is, is it really something which which is a big concern? Is something which finds its own way eventually? You know, every, every, through through every example, and we've seen many examples of that public conflict happen. For example, in the case of WhatsApp or Twitter, um, all that stuff. How how does that play out? And how do you think it's likely to uh, evolve? <clears throat> I think uh, muted. Who, who is this question aimed? Yeah. I, it was to Deepika, I think. Probably. Yeah, we muted. Unmute yourself. Deepika, you are, <laughs> we can't hear you. Uh, I, I, for um, some reasons, I, I, can, I can see that you are trying to speak, but we can't hear you. <laughs> yes, you unmute, unmute. I think Deepika, you have to unmute. Can is please? not on mute actually. I think she's finding difficulty in her system is unmuted. So we can hear you now. Yeah, no. Oh, that was not Deepika, that was somebody else. That was for me. Click, click that mic at the left corner of your screen, left lower corner. All right, uh, while, while, uh, while Deepika figures out, uh, let me ask you another question uh, for you, Ajit uh, and Vikrant. Um, these, it's, and it's about the big technology companies, like we talk about big tech, right? Um, uh, you know, big tech actually really are companies like you know, Google, Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, social, social media companies, and they are transnational companies, right? They do not, um, they do not, um, they say we are actually here to, and they actually then espouse, which they say are our, corporate values, our company values. And we they want to say, we want to enforce a certain kind of values on our platform, whether it's Facebook, whether it's you know, um, Google, or whether it's you know, Twitter or other companies. And those are at times in conflict with the local government. And we've seen kind of examples of that in India, uh, very wide public examples of that. Uh, we, we've seen that um, in US, we've seen that in different parts of the world. How? Uh, how, how do sort of, you know, how, how should the government and the big tech think about that? Uh, because this is not gonna go away, you know? Uh, uh, there are, there are, the governments want to control, uh, have a control on the masses uh, to, their, uh, to their citizens, uh, some governments more than others. Big tech wants to have, you know, uh, uh, run a business uh, um, um, or sort of using the data and user platform. And when they try to do that, that, that there is a conflict here basically. So how, what is the way in which this, this can become more smooth and efficient rather than be a confrontation between the big tech and the government, which we've seen a lot of examples of worldwide. Who, who is this addressed to? Uh, this is for you, Ajit, first. <clears throat> no, you know, there is um, there is a conflict. I hear about it, and I often get calls from the Asian government saying, Ajit, what do you think of this, et cetera. But, you know, I think the, the real issue here is uh, India uh, it has kind of lost out because uh, I know myself, I, uh, Relief.com, most of you guys may not know this. Our main business is provide enterprise email services and messenger services to companies. And we directly fight Google and uh, Microsoft. 
the, it's not that they're unfair competition, but I think in uh, we have we have about 18 percent of the market. And they have 98 for the rest of it. Uh, I, I think it's um, we need uh, our uh, IAS officers and policy makers. We need to take them through how network effects works and how that can create monopolies different from earlier time, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a mutual education doing. It's not that it's not that we don't want these big tech, so-called big tech companies not to be in India. That would be a big loss for us as consumers as well as players. But there is some method of regulating which is not like the MRTP Act or et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's a chapter by itself. How do you learn to have a country which has them at the same time you coexist. Uh, Chinese friends, for example, are very, very clearly nationalistic about tech, very clearly. They have outright banned many of these American big tech companies. Um, in India, I think we, we have to sit and talk. I don't, there is a, there's no simple prescription because we need to have them here at the same time uh, get them to work within a competitive framework so that Indian companies can also exist. You know? We don't want them to be wiped out completely. Uh, and uh, it's the whole startup scene in India is geared towards funding these startups and then finding a way to sell them to Facebook or Google or somebody else. All, all that we need to sit and talk. And, and guys like you should be more involved in public policy debates. You know? you know? Take some time away from your businesses and spend time on these things, guys. My advice. <laughs> <laughs> government will benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Same advice. Uh, what do you what, what do you what do you think, Vikram? I think uh, this is a sensitive issue. Uh, one has to one has to understand that uh, when there is an interface where in a country like India, you know, so you have so so presently you are facing uh, you are seeing that that there is a conflict between Twitter and the government, and then you are also seeing challenges which Amazon and uh, you know the the e-commerce giants are having in terms of expanding their business, in terms of trying to find uh, new uh, marketing techniques, if I may use that word and not use the word predatory techniques, which is what is used. So I think uh, as Ajit very rightly said, uh, there's no simple answer to this. You have to sit and negotiate. You have to sit and talk. The, the, the challenge in India is that uh, we are a volatile democracy. The good part is we are a democracy and unlike China, we cannot say that the state cannot say that we are going to do this and it's going to happen. You are going to have a very strong section of people, you know, a huge person, a, a strong uh, you know, a section of people, a percentage of people who are going to oppose certain uh, policies of the government. And, uh, and like Twitter, for instance, became a tool where people would put up their uh, objections to the government. And it is cutting across political parties. It is cutting across the executive framework where when uh, you know, I get calls from various police officials who say, I want to sue this guy. He has written this about me in the Twitter. We get calls from the government saying uh, that, you know, that people are writing against us in Twitter and we need to go after them. And uh, this is not fair because uh, they are airing their views and uh, people are losing confidence in this particular uh, you know, mechanism or this particular scheme that we have launched. So uh, the, the, the judicial system is one, but I think this it requires more of a social, political, uh, business debate. And uh, I think Ajit is right. You know, people need to take time off from their business and also invest a good amount of time in public policy, encourage legitimate, good quality debates in this. I think one of the biggest challenges India has is that we have institutional weakness in terms of debates. We don't have adequate centers. We don't have adequate, we have qualified individuals, but we don't have organizations, we don't have establishments which can stand up and make a commitment without aligning itself to either the opposition or the government. They need to be strongly independent, uh, you know, uh, strongly independent uh, organizations who can, uh, who can sit and navigate and make the parties sit and, uh, and talk them through. But I, I don't see this going away. I, I, I mean, I think the recent uh, challenges which uh, Twitter is facing, uh, the, the recent challenges which CCI has put on uh, the e-commerce portals, I, I think uh, this is something that is going to go on. The unfortunate thing is that the government has an upper hand in most of these dealings because they have the enforcement, the legal enforcement powers with them. So they have the policing powers with them and they tend to arm twist individuals a lot. So I think a certain uh, safe, uh, that kind of prevents uh, eco space 
where a lot of uh, people are not able to uh, innovate businesses or are, are actually skeptical to take decisions. I think a certain amount of balance will have to be struck over a period of time. But yeah, negotiations of business houses, businessmen, entrepreneurs, politicians, uh, you know, policymakers, lawyers, judges, all these, uh, there has to be more platforms and forums where they can sit and air their views fearlessly uh, and uh, then come out with some kind of uh, you know policy which will be ever evolving i don't think you can have a policy which will say that this is it and this is how it's going to be done in the next five years absolutely i, I think technology keep evolving and that actually keep producing us new portion this is ever evolving this is going to be uh, that is why there need to be a dynamic legal management system as well not just a static one and our system has <laughs> no change in very many decades and sometimes hundreds of years we have laws which are like hundreds of years old so they need to they need to all I'm just checking whether Deepika is able to speak now. Uh, Deepika, uh, I uh, hope you can hear. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I'm, okay. I'm just dialing from my mobile. Okay, welcome to the, uh, the debate. What is Deepika? What's your perspective? You have you have a global global perspective on this, having worked with multinational corporation. What is your perspective on this topic? Um, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful wonderful discussion. And you know, there's one more thing. Um, I am having a trouble uh, listening my own voice. And I don't know how to fix it. Is it and I think it is funny you're, that you know this is how technology fine kind of we're, we're, we're able to hear you. Okay, so no problem. Let's try to work within our constraints. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. And you know, I was following this discussion, and, and as somebody said that you know, Vikram said that you know, um, the uh, technology has evolved faster, and uh, the legal framework around it take some time to kind of grow. Um, we can see that. I mean, when what happens is you would remember uh, way back in 2008, there was one particular time when everybody's email were kind of flooded with all your GDPR notices. And even till now, you would see that, you know, uh, you would uh, have uh, emails coming in uh, telling you that, you know, our privacy policy has kind of changed. Email very yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it all makes sense. It's weird. Uh, so so you would see that yeah. you know those, those all you know you know bombarding all those mails that our privacy policies have changed this change that change etc etc. Why does it happen? It happens because you know you start with a particular uh, venture or a business. You have certain things which are in uh, your control. Can somebody please watch a melon? Hi everybody. You can go on mute if you're not speaking. Oh yeah, that's yours. Yeah, I mean, now is the time. This is a request to everyone to please go on mute, except the speaker. Thank you. Go ahead, Deepika. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, why these kind of disruptions happen? Because, you know, uh, technology is something which is very intuitive, is faster, it can evolve, but law is very, very reactive. It takes a lot of time. Way back in GDPR time in 2018, I was, I uh, remember this very distinctively, uh, the uh, insurance sector was regulated by the, uh, the Insurance Act and the data management, the data warehousing never had any specific you know, controls over it. And the people who were in, in, in the ownership of that data would kind of very freely able to uh, distribute and use this data and information to their advantage. But when all the legal frameworks came in, the entire industry was in a kind of disruption and in a kind of you know, reactive mode that you know, how and how fast we can you know, adapt to all these things. And you know, this is where um, you know, a big challenge of bringing in new costs, new people, new frameworks, new compliances kind of comes in. Now, um, a standard question is if you're a startup, I mean, this is an industry which is well-established insurance is a very old industry, which is you know, being in this uh, domain, established players. When they are having these problems, what about the startups? I mean, when you and Ajit later in this conversation was mentioning that, you know, uh, startups now, when they start, they don't really care about how the legal hurdles are going to be. And when you start up startup, uh, you don't really care about, you know, how a prospective legal change is going to hit you back. Um, this is where, uh, you know, this entire game becomes very, very complex because, you know, when things come in, uh, people and startups and the business 
is kind of feel very lost and kind of feel very reactive and you know very restrictive sometimes they have to change their business models they have to change their entire strategy they have to kind of rework their operations they have to rework their uh, you know frameworks and the way they uh, you know manage and all that things so uh, how do we figure out that you know how do we get away or get out of this these kind of situations the answer is very simple you know try to understand uh, what is that matters to you? I mean, data is something which is absolutely important to the startups, to an established organization, um, to anything and everything. And then, so I would, I, as I would like to uh, call in that while data is asset, privacy is your fundamental right and cybersecurity is your safeguard. So this is like a three-way, a three-step process. You understand as a startup or a business that what's your primary data need or what's your kind of business need, then and that is your treated as an asset. Have a regular roadmap and try to understand what is the legal framework around you and how proactive it is uh, or um, to kind of how, how vulnerable is it is uh, to kind of change. Nothing changes overnight in a legal world. So rest assured, every business would have a lot of time for public participation to assess privacy bills, to assess the legal bills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's kind of an internalization to understand that are you still following the debate or you're just waiting for the bomb to kind of get dropped on to you? You know, so these are my points of view from the point of view of how to manage the change in an ever changing world if you're a startup or you are um, an established organization. Uh, that's from the legal point of view. Of course, the law of the land and the layout and uh, the frameworks are complicated. I mean, in India, within India, cybersecurity has a different set of you know laws. Your IT and Technology Act would be there. You know, you have certain definitions of, uh, you know, your um, the, uh, personal and sensitive information, and then you know your organization would be open and went to all those definitions, and you would kind of, you know, tag along and get into all those complications. So you would start right from reviewing your employee letters to your customer communication to your product information so much of it going on so i am not expected and, and and i'm not expecting that you know i would be teaching you all that you know in the session today so you know i know it is complicated i'm just giving you a heads up that you know when things come don't wait for the last moment just you know try to follow the policy debate just see what's happening and you would know for your organization or your startup or you know if you're already in that space which is a non legal tech space you would know that you know how how to kind of uh, uh, you know, balance out the factors. And I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, it's because it's very close to my heart, tech for legal. And probably I'm going to take three minutes for the tech for legal and uh, would want to uh, put up uh, 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 my way of looking at it. So as Vikrant was saying, you know, and this, and this is a complex game. We, and, and I would like to see this as a supply chain it's a legal supply chain and who uh, how exactly it starts it starts with a lot of parties uh, you have judiciary ha having its own challenges but you have solo practitioners who would who may also be in need of some uh, you know intelligent solutions to maintain their practice and to become efficient that's where your ai and machine learning could be really really instrumental and you know could be very helpful you have a second uh, beneficiary or a party or like um, uh, the interested kind of uh, this thing. You, you have law firms, big chunk who are dealing with a lot of load. Then you have personal corporations, private companies, all those people in some or the other way, they are definitely using a lot of legalities and legal instrumentalities and legal instruments. They can be on your contract side, they could be on your business side. And this is where, if technology really comes in, um, may be a product based on your AI machine learning, analysis of document management, may be your court uh, you know, case analysis, judgment analysis, all those kind of good stuff. Um, 
they sound very tempting. They are kind of very, very efficient solutions. Uh, and technology can actually bring in a lot of value to legal systems and not only to the judicial system, but the entire way a business is being run. So today, a typical corporation, um, and it's very, very industry dependent, you know, if you go to, so I work for long years for Unilever's, uh, Unilever and um, I noticed that there are certainly op operations where, um, if there are products which are kind of AI based, uh, they are way more efficient. So your small things like legal meteorology. Uh, so what exactly happens is how are you, you know, doing product labelings on certain products, etc. Right now, the, there is a lot of human inter intervention which is which goes into it. Um, I am kind of not sure if they are you know smarter or uh, artificially artificial intelligence artificially intelligence ai ml based you know uh, products which are available to tackle those situations those are very standard kind of problems okay and um, having a smarter solution to that is something which is which is a great idea uh, why somebody has not done it because honestly speaking because lawyers are not techies like you and probably they can't really code and understand how to figure out a solution for that so that's probably one area where you know things could really uh, go into a great direction. So there are uh, multiple opportunities that, which requires a kind of intersection between understanding the legal framework and understanding um, the need of how to pick up the speed and the industry and you know there are smarter solutions which can definitely definitely come in. Now where's the problem you know if this is so simple where's the problem? The problem is your AI and ML or a smarter solution would always take a lot of time to learn, educate, and perfect itself. And on the other side, the legal uh, environment and the systems and are very, very dynamic. They're open for interpretation, not the two things would look the same and you know, challenges are going to come in from there. How do we solve this? It's definitely going to take time, but these are the kind of forums where we talk about various things. Uh, this area, the subject is very, very wide. And you know, I'm only talking about the collection of information, making the products, making things, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There's another beast, which is out open there in the woods. Number one, uh, the custom uh, the consumer education or the customer education and uh, the adaptability. I mean, everybody remembers when WhatsApp came with the, their privacy policy changes, there was a huge havoc going on, right? Uh, was I'm, I'm not going to comment whether the policy was right or wrong or anything like that, but was it really understood in the right way or the means it was meant to be understood? The answer is no. So these kind of challenges would always, always come. You, you are always going to find those, you know, uh, problems. So. There is a lot of added responsibility on uh, us as uh, lawyers, people who understand not only uh, not only as lawyers, but you know everybody who understands a little bit of you know these uh, scenarios to at least you know keep the rumors in check and make it kind of more communication friendly to make people understand that what's going on. And this is just only the data collection and you know monitoring part of it. There's a big beast out again out there in the open woods. People are not sensitive about you know what is going to happen to their information or uh, any data which is collected today, irrespective if it is collected through a smart system or a technology, et cetera, et cetera. We, we actually forgot the right to be forgotten. So, you know, in 10 years of time, which is a very, very important component, if you see GDPR, if you see CCPA, a right to be forgotten is going to be the next hottest thing. And, you know, nobody is really talking in India about right to be forgotten as yet. Perhaps there are some specific laws which touch briefly on this, but this is, a, this is going to be in five or 10 years of time, this is going to be a huge, huge challenge. You know, how to enterprise on your data, how to delete it, and how to make sure that your data practices are kind of, you know, on, on in the game and kind of safe. So I know I have over exceeded my time and, you know, I would be very happy to answer any questions, but, you know, this, I, I hope I could give you a realistic view of how it looks like. And honestly, it's, 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 it's so huge and widespread that, you know, I don't think so that, you know, even five hours on this topic is going to justify yeah, today. 
Yeah, you're right. So, there is a lot to be covered here, and as you know, it's your time. We have plenty of time, so we'll keep bringing. Oh, you. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just uh, continue on that. Vikrant, what is the as a lawyer? What will be your advice to the government on this? Because uh, this is this is going to be a two way street. You know that the, the, the entrepreneurs will keep forcing their way um, with whatever practical solution they can find to launch a new idea, even if it is in. Um, is conflict with the existing legal system uh, because entrepreneurs are like that. They want to create opportunity. They want to create, they want to simplify life. They want to, you know, uh, so they will keep doing that. But at times that happens to be in conflict with the, with the, with the legal system. What is, if you were to give advice, um, collective or collection of us, how, what is our advice to the different government and let's say the government of India in this case? Vikrata, you're on mute. See, the biggest challenge, as Divika said, is that technology moves at a very fast pace. The, the legislature, the judiciary, they are just not able to keep pace with that, or, or even the executive. I think the one, one thing that government really needs to invest is education. They need to educate their officers. Like I, I think Divika was giving an example at Hindustan Legal, you know, at Hindustan Levers of Legal Metrology Department, where they do the labeling. And these officers have no clue of what the latest technologies, techniques are. So, uh, so I think education is very, very important. And I think sometime back, Ajit was talking about how uh, the rules of football were being, were being imported into the game of cricket. And uh, that is exactly the problem. I remember doing a case a couple of years back where uh, it was a, I was arguing a bail matter. And uh, the allegation was that one of the allegations against my client was that at the age of 26, he had uh, he had built a business where he was earning every month around about 10 to 15 lakh rupees. And that was the argument of the prosecution that how can someone who's 26 years old make so much of money unless it's a scam? And and the judge agreed. You know, he, he turned to me and he said, he's a you know, he's a young kid. And he's got two Mercedes Benz and he's got a 3,000 square feet apartment in Bombay. And this is unheard of. So he must, have, he must be doing something wrong. And this is the time when I think WhatsApp was just acquired by Facebook. So I pulled out the newspaper article and I gave it to the bank. I said, my Lord, please have a look at it. This is a company which barely has 60 employees. It sold for $20 billion. These are the modern businesses. Yeah. They don't work. You know, they don't work in the old structure where there has to be land to, for it to have assets. It, it has to have land banks. It has to have sales. It has to, you know, the valuations are different. I'm not getting into the merits of whether it's correct or wrong, but not everybody who's doing something innovative or something very creative is a scamster. And that is the problem. You know, the, uh, the state needs to offer a platform for its entrepreneurs. It needs to, uh, it needs to provide that space that they can freely innovate. And of course, if, if somebody is indulging in scam, if somebody is indulging in some fraudulent activity, they need to be penalized severely and fast. The problem is because our justice system is so slow that uh, the benefit of doubt is never given to the person who, who, who is uh, sitting in the accused chair, is never given. It's always with the prosecution and prosecution because of lack of education, you know, I've spoken to the police officer and I, I interact with them on and on. And I, very few of them actually get, and this is, what I'm talking from Bombay, right? Very few of them actually understand the new businesses. They look at everything through those same colored lenses, you know, the old license Raj lenses. They, they, they just can't understand that entrepreneurship, you know, the benefits, the, the motivation, the drive that people can get out of it. And the, and the, and the, and the reason of how people get into it and get to, create new models and experiment new models. And I'm sure most of them fail, but very few officers understand that. By and large, they don't. So I think the most important thing is that the judiciary needs to be, edu uh, needs to be educated. The, the executive needs to be educated. They need to understand that. And government yes. needs to have, needs to keep having training programs for Everyone, the, please for go the on. and for the executive uh, officials. Because otherwise you will always have a situation where the rules of cricket will be in football and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good analogy. Uh, so what are the, I was just uh, talking about some of the, uh, we talked about how technology sort of challenges the law, but there are some new new ones which are emerging and I think the laws for them are still not framed 
for example, you know, the drones, you know, what will they get legalized? You know, what can, can some one person send a drone to somebody's house uh, and overlook their house as an example uh, of sort of you know, how um, our technology always is sort of ahead of the law and kind of how do sort of how do governments respond to uh, those, those challenges? Did they, and this can have, uh, uh, Vikrant, real, um, real world um, sort of crime issues, right? Somebody can misuse, uh, uh, misuse that uh, to, yeah. to, to which are sort of, you know, which violates on somebody's privacy or even even even, even uh, other thing or actually you know cause harm. Um, uh, are we sort of you know, even are the governments even thinking about that or they're just kind of hoping that you know uh, the, the, with with the time we'll figure out a way. Um. No, so a lot of thinking actually you'll be surprised. You know, uh, in the in, in the in the union government, a lot of thinking actually goes into all this. And okay, if, you, if you're taking the example of drones, so uh, you. One has to understand that India is surrounded not exactly by very friendly neighbors. We are not like Europe, right? We have, we have, we have complicated relationships with our neighbors, and there's been intrusion into our borders. You know, many, you know, a couple of you know, many years ago, there was an attack in the city of Bombay, and I I remember in 2011 or 2011 12, there was one particular uh, food uh, food restaurant uh, where this guy had imported a drone and he delivered. He made a delivery of his pizza to some apartment using the drone, and it, I think it, it went on social media and, and it went fairly viral. And, and then there was an investigation into the whole thing. The whole system was scared, and they were not scared that somebody was doing this. They were scared, see, because a lot of legislation is done from negative eyes. Uh, a lot of negative, a lot of laws are made not as how it could benefit, but what if something goes wrong? Then what are the ramifications of that? So with that mindset and with the kind of uh, socio, uh, you know, social security setup that India has around itself and we have our own internal problems, I think it's, 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 it's going to take a lot of time. If you see the drone regulations, also though the government has eased it a lot, still there's a long way to go because again, the technology is evolving so fast. I, I had a client who came to me and who told me that nowadays drones are as tiny as a bee. Yeah. Now, when you have those kind of mechanisms, and you have social unrest in the country, you have, uh, you know, your political neighbors are not very friendly. The government is not going to be very, uh, you know, very generous with this regulatory, you know, structure and framework. They are going to be, they are going to be more uh, cautious uh, than sorry. So um, I, 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 you know, very, very great perspective, uh, you know, Vikrant. And, you know, I, I really want to chip in here and want to tell you that, see, the legal frameworks are kind of integrated. You can't really uh, talk about drone laws without talking. So I'm, I'm just going to give you a reference of certain practices which US has adopted. So you can't talk about drone laws without talking about your air rights. You cannot talk about drone laws without talking about your privacy. And things basically unfold, uh, you know, on in, in during their life cycles. So in India, privacy is now considered as a fundamental right. And it came through not by way of regulation, but by a way of a judgment of a Supreme Court. So now that is where you kind of started for thing into that. And everything else will kind of now start piling up. And when it will happen, we, why are we talking only about drones? Why are we not talking about, you know, a, a huge helicopter with a super giant camera, which can actually look into the heat map of your house and can tell you that, you know, um, what you're doing in your house or, or, can, or, you know, what kind of person you are and, you know, really have magnetic, uh, magnetic waves or something which are projected on your house and or your industry and, you know, shut down certain operations using those kind of technologies. So these, what I'm talking to you right now might sound like a sci-fi fantasy, but it is not far from reality. Let me also show you that. So when we talk about laws and when we talk about technology, you cannot really look into things in piecemeal basis and in isolation. And how to solve these problems? I mean, we are coming together for these discussions 
we are the positive influencers on the policy making in this country. Uh, we are definitely responsible. So if we leave everything else to only the regulators and the legislators and think that it is their job, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> the collective wisdom of this country is sure. too You're high and, and, and for a reason because everybody chips in. Yeah. So let us not leave it to that particular level when we say that, okay, for the most perfect lawmaking, there would be one person who is given on that particular you know, position and the opportunity and the responsibility and that guy is going to do it. No, we all have to do it. And how do we do it? The easiest way is if you find a problem, talk about it. If you think there are certain challenges, talk about it. These are exactly why these forums you know, are there for. And I'm so glad that we are on one So today. So we are, I think, positively contributing to that uh, space already. So it's, it's going to be a fairly uh, interesting game for the rest of the time. Um, and I'm happy to you know, uh, see how the things are developing. Perhaps they're also, I also believe that what we are doing is a lot of work in a silo. There's a lot of things we do not need to reinvent the wheel. There would be a time, in my personal opinion and belief, there would be a time when all these kind of standard data practices and all these things, there would be harmonization of certain laws at some level. Now, having worked in a space and being, my, being an entrepreneur myself, worked in the e-commerce space and the, the internet-based um, infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. You cannot just wait for that day that you know one country would have some laws and some other laws and then you know, this is all over the place and so much of complication. There would eventually be this entire thing will eventually will go grow towards you know, certain common uh, minimum denominators or common set of rules and laws and um, and I'm very hopeful that you know we would see that there are some efforts which are on a global level already done. There are best practices which are already been adopted. India is kind of opening up, but every country and jurisdiction has their own challenges. And the best way is to adopt, get some best practices, export your best practices, and the best possible is harmonize the things which matter to the entire human community and the business community instead of just creating more complex silos. So that's, I, I, I think this is going to happen and we are going to see this sometime very, very soon. And my sometime very soon could be 10 to 15 years. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a very, very fast time in legal world. Uh, so 10 to 15 years. <laughs> so, no, uh, don't be too judgmental, you know, believe it or not. I mean, the Supreme Court sit in the middle of the night uh, to, you know, make sure that if there is a matter of urgency, we yeah. solve it. <laughs> Lokinder, I, I would have agreed with you, but, you know, in the last <laughs> one, the response of the judiciary has been something which has taken all of us by surprise. Trust me. Yes, absolutely. Really by surprise. Encouraging sign. Actually, but I, I didn't mean judiciary itself, <laughs> actually legal system. I actually mean uh, the law firms, the global law firms, how they are kind of wedded to their own model of, you know, working through a kind of model, which, which works really well for the senior lawyers, but actually doesn't work well for the customers. So I think there are examples of that, but, but uh, the response you uh, it has been really, really good. You're right. The, the house kind of, you know, especially during the last 12 months, the whole legal system responded to continue to deliver the justice um, to people has been commendable. We we have some questions coming in. We'll take those questions. But before I get into question, Monisha, the first question, but before I get into that, I just want to leave people with some thought about where are the opportunities? And I think you referred to it um, in your earlier comments uh, and Ajit also referred to it, but for entrepreneurs, you know, we are kind of, uh, we are engineers, entrepreneurs, and we actually look for opportunities to kind of solve the problems. What would you pick at or what one or two opportunities which you think people can go back to saying, okay, this, if I do this, there is that I can solve a big problem in legal world. And actually I could create a business uh, which is impactful business. So what would your pick be? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't get your question. My, I was trying to ask with Vikrant and Deepika to both of you, where do you think if somebody want to create a technology uh, for improving legal system for a new mm -hmm. entrepreneur, what what are the one or two areas you will pick for to recommend uh, to a new entrepreneur to say you try this this is a good opportunity um, to develop a technology in the field of legal and which can be a sound business as well. I okay, would... um, 
Oh, well, please go ahead, Vikram. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead okay, so I would say that, you know, uh, as, I, as I mentioned that, you know, in legal is also an industry, you know, try to understand what are the touch points in this in entire industry. Look at it as a very, very pragmatic, practical, objective supply chain. What is your input and what is your output and what are these kind of processes? And if you are able to kind of, you know, even uh, automatize or solution, even a single bit of it, it can be your document collection, your document management, your logic or reasoning. It could be a, a giant corporation trying to, you know, do certain practices compliances there are so many compliances which could be you know moved to automatic systems there uh, if that can be done that could be a great solution so just the i i think the key to it is don't look at the legal industry as something which is which is complicated just look at it as like a normal business operation so you know it's just a supply chain it's yes. just a supply chain the way you automatize supply chain just try to bring in your expertise there, try to solution that and see that, you know, how the technology could, you know, solve one piece of it or the entire piece of it. It You can pick and choose from anywhere, you know, the uh, industry specific problem or industry specific legal function. It could be uh, a court specific or anything. So, you know, um, just look out for uh, those kind of uh, frameworks and you should be able to identify. Um, Perhaps there could always be certain challenges, uh, but so would any other business would have, right? Any other supply chain would have. They would, they, the feasibility could, I mean, of course, you would evaluate that idea on your feasibility study that, you know, how much of effort it is going to take and, you know, whether it is going to be feasible, it's going to make uh, sense to the end customer or not. So, and for that, uh, of course, you do your feasibility study, not only in the focused group of the engineers and the tech guys, but maybe go back to the lawyers and try to figure out, you know, if that makes sense to them, because, you know, uh, it should not happen that you propose a solution, you develop a product, and uh, at the end of the day, a, a firm or a lawyer or a, a consumer of that particular uh, uh, thing says, and, hmm, I already know this, and, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, I can intellectually do it. And, you know, I don't see a value in, in, in investing into this particular proposition. So, yeah. So I think the key lies in sound it off with the right uh, stakeholders and it, find industry problem, do a very, very, very critical uh, uh, feasibility study and see if it is actually worth uh, an investment to be sustained in the light of uh, adverse regulation or a staple coming in. Because you know it, it can a, a negative law can come any time to bar you, but that's also a, a a known risk in a normal business function as well. So just a heads up over there. Thank you, Deepika. Yeah. Uh, Vikrant, what is your uh, one or two? And then we get to the question. What is your one or two opportunities advice to the entrepreneurs? I think I would say if they can look at the litigation practice management system. So when I say litigation practice management, what I mean is that. India follows a common law system, which, which basically means that we rely a lot on legal precedents. Now that enables one to have a lot of space to, uh, to innovate in prediction, uh, to invest in uh, prediction technology, legal analytics, uh, you know, documentation automation and all is already going on. But I think a lot can be done in terms of prediction technology and legal analytics. I don't think that is being done in this country. And uh, I think, uh, Litigation practice management can also you you will have to work along with the government. You you will uh, you will uh, you will just not need your entrepreneurial skills. You need a lot of social political skills to navigate the the minefield. And I'm calling it minefield very very consciously. I mean I'm 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 choosing my words very very consciously. And I think uh, thereby helping create a you know an 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 a, a, a ecosystem where the court management system, which is which is being created, but it can it can be done a lot better, you know, file management system, docket management system, uh, you know, listing automation systems. Uh, you know, I, I think if that, if uh, I think there's a lot of scope, I have not seen anybody come uh, in this. A lot of people are coming in and doing, uh, are, are investing in products which are, uh, which are there in connection with practice management for law firms, like, you know, real time sheet filling, your, your, your billing protocols, your, team analysis, your investment you know, from legal business analysis, there's a lot of work going there. 
but i don't think in terms of litigation practice management there is any work so i think if uh, if entrepreneurs are really looking for if that is one area i think uh, a lot of work a, a lot of good work can be done and there's a lot of scope because i don't really see too many uh, i actually haven't seen any you know any player in that area and quite a few uh, my uh, you know my college friends who uh, you know some of them who went to iits from my school they uh, they have approached me with a lot of thoughts but nobody wants to touch this area and maybe commercial reasons are there but uh, but i do think that if you can t- take it to a certain take it to a certain level uh, you know then I, uh, of course you can monetize it you know uh-huh. i'm sure people will pay if things can be done in matter of hours and not even weeks and and years as as it takes in india today if uh, if if one can speed up that process people will pay for it there is a portion here is global portion is not just yeah, yeah. so uh, th- thank you very much vikram i think you know you really have uh, you know identified one of the most crucial spaces which india needs right now and you know that's like something very very urgent and important and uh, while you talk about one of the most amazing and important areas where you know a focus is uh, needed i thought i'll put in my wish list too uh, my wish list has uh, i really see that you know um, as they say that in, in the next world is all about data 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 the next next generation next life next you know few years is all about data 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 and a lot of information data warehousing data management etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'm extremely passionate about you know privacy and cyber security so i'm definitely going to talk about a little bit about it so today everybody is focused on collecting that in, uh, information data securing that information data through cyber security practices managing the data leaks and you know breaches and confidentiality and all and everything but right now nobody is talking about when we would be so data heavy how to get rid of that data how to make sure that the confidentiality of the people is kind of managed so uh, if i would give you a wish list i wa- i would want to you know see technology helping in finding out a solution to how to get rid of the data so right now the bigger struggles are with uh, something called right to be forgotten and you know uh, which basically is a right that you know if you don't want any particular organization or a data warehousing to remember you uh, you want to opt out and you want your information to be deleted they have to do that they have to comply with it and if you go to most of the privacy policies of uh, you know and for for example i'm just going to talk about uh, um facebook what facebook does is if there is a by the way uh, 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 there was an interesting study which i have conducted uh, while uh, last year um where i was you know um conducting a research on uh, how exactly the privacy policies of various uh, um social media websites etc were with reference to right to be forgotten and i realized that you know uh not something very shocking but you would also you know love the fact that 80% of the people in today's world and more than 80% would just click the i agree button without even knowing where that information is going and how it is going to be used 55% of my responders to that particular sub, you know survey and that study uh, w- wanted to permanently delete their information from uh, the portals and to the people who have they they have given and out of that 50% 50, uh, 55% people 50% actually tried also to get rid of that information but you know where it stops the best practice is facebook uh you stop where you just delete from the local like you you put up a request for deleting your information it will delete your information but only uh for a limited time and your uh, the backups which they have created would still sustain that information about you so whatever you are posting today on a social media platform can be pulled at any particular point in time and this is not only the social media platforms your information with any of the financial institution any of the health institution perhaps us has kind of stricter laws india is still waiting for hipa kind of laws but you know one place where technology can really break a big impact is to solve this problem of 
how at an individual level a person can track that information, get rid of that information, and how an organization or a data collector or a processor can get rid of the information in long term. That's my wish list, guys. I hope you know if, if some of you can solve that problem, it's a gold mine in 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 my opinion, like only my opinion, not in advice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Deepika. Moni, uh, Moni, she is you. Uh, you have a question. You've been raising your hand for a long time. Sorry about making you wait. Uh, please go ahead with your question. It's not really a question. It's an issue that I'm, I'm based in Silicon Valley in uh, California. And it's an issue that a number of uh, co-founders of startup space. Now, invariably, ideation and germinating an idea takes place while the co-founder is still working or employed by somebody or studying in the university. And should they be enormously successful at a future date, then you find uh, the ex-employer or the university comes after them and say, hey, wait, now, didn't you develop a part of this stuff while you were with us? You know, and uh, what's, uh, what's going to be our share in your uh, IP? So the IP law, I mean, this is something we try to educate our startups here, like Stanford University has got very clear cut rules. If you have spent time in Stanford, I mean, let's say Google founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page were students in Stanford and Stanford gets a huge amount of royalty out of uh, Google, you know, and in fact, one of your sponsors, Asha Jadeja, her late husband, uh, Rajiv Motwane, uh, you know, he was the professor for Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Now, the, with, uh, People who worked in employment, you know, where invariably we tell them, you look at your employment agreement, you know, does your agreement say that anything that you do in the entire 10, 24 hour period belongs to your employer during the time period? Because nobody really jumps out and starts with an idea. In, they want to play it safe. They want to do it while they're working on somebody else's time. And this is a problem. We're getting to some kind of a formulation about what they should and should not do to play it safe so that they have uh, a major control on the IP. You know, uh, I don't know where India is on this issue. Maybe uh, Vikrant Vikrant will know probably. Yeah. yeah, I started the IIT startups here four years ago. And uh, we are now opening up in India. Pradeep is leading our effort over there, Pradeep Bhargav. And, uh, you know, this is a problem which could uh, impact uh, the startups in India, although we still find that a lot of the startups in India are still uh, more service oriented, but it could come about. Yeah, Vikrant, uh, yeah. probably you're the best person to answer this. Uh, in India, it is still governed by the contractual uh, relationship. There is no statute to, uh, to govern this relationship between employee, employer, and the terms and conditions. So it's, 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 it's uh, governed. But what I've seen is in a startup or even in, uh, in uh, organizations, it is the, uh, maybe the situation, the employee typically uh, doesn't get uh, too much of negotiation, you know, a right to negotiate. And the reason for it is probably because he's desperate for a job or he's looking for a job at the beginning. And, uh, and if you're joining a startup, say not exactly a startup, if you're joining a company, then uh, that company has a very robust, because they have already invested with their lawyers, a lot of time has gone in in, uh, in uh, drafting the uh, employment agreement terms and conditions. And, we, and, and when we represent those companies, we ensure that uh, the, these, uh, the contractual obligations are that uh, whatever work uh, or whatever research that is done at the time of employment belongs only to the company and not to the employer because because these are governed under the contractual uh, you know contractual rights and these are not statute driven rights so uh, i think uh, i don't think there's an easy answer to this uh, because companies do spend a lot of money in r and d uh, we are seeing that uh, time and again that uh, there are people who violate that trust. Uh, we've gone after them, and you'll be surprised. The legal system is not that uh, is is not up to speed in in uh, in giving quick delivery of uh, justice to the companies. It takes time. So uh, so the thing is that uh, one needs to uh, 
you know if i'm talking on behalf of a company they 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 keep working on their hr policies on their uh, you know on their uh, uh, on their employment uh, terms and conditions and if you are a very bright uh, enterprising individual and there are many of them i'll uh, give you an example of uh, an automaker i cannot name him because it's confidential agreement uh, uh, so he 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 approached one of the leading uh, automakers in india and he he had certain technology which he was very confident about which would increase the efficiency and the mileage of the of the cars and this is uh, i think in the cng uh, you know in the cng sector and uh, the company was like no we are going to only negotiate and we are only going to give this term but he was so confident of his uh, terms and i was on behalf of the company so when we were trying to negotiate with him he said nothing doing i believe in my product if you don't take it i'll take it somewhere else but i i but i've not seen too many people have that confidence and uh, i guess uh, this is something dynamic and this will take you know it's something which will uh, which will just evolve over a period of time but uh, but as i said uh, this is driven by contracts is individual relationships uh, it's not driven by statute so there's nothing that the state can do in this case and the courts have also commented uh, that uh, apart from non compete which is not illegal in india you can join a competing business because you have a right to business you have a right to livelihood uh, that's your fundamental right unlike in the us where you can even uh, bind a person against joining a competitor so uh, so there is a very few regal there's a very little regal room for the uh, for the employee in this in these kind of matters so uh, there's one more question for you uh, vikram probably for uh, relevant for you from arvind pardeshi and his question is what is the probable year by which india can expect to have proper laws dealing specifically on aspects of artificial intelligence <laughs> <laughs> see this is a this is an evolving area this is an evolving area i can't uh, but i think by 2025 we will have a lot of uh, transparency a lot of systems will be put in place and you will have a much better ecosystem both in terms of uh, see because we we do have a strong central government we have we and they are there with a strong majority and uh, they have certain plans of making india a self reliant nation they have certain uh, you know they have certain policies and framework in mind and uh, because they control the parliament so it's faster for them to get the laws and the bills passed which which otherwise would have taken time so i think uh, and the good thing is that in india there is a general consensus though these politicians may fight on the floor of the house and on twitter they may keep you know abusing each other and cutting each other to size but there is a policy if you see in terms of policy there is a consensus in these matters so i think if uh, i think by 2025 you will see a lot of change i can't say that it will be near perfect or whatever. i i don't think in the legal world anywhere in the world anything is perfect everything is evolving if it is perfect then i don't think it's going to, it's, it's it's going to sustain for long we need to what we need to have is transparent sustainable systems in place transparent sustainable laws and procedures in place and i think by 2025 we will see a lot of that and i am and i do strongly believe that india will be a very different place to do business a very good place to do business at that time thank you uh, vikram there is one more question we going to answer live which is a very broad question and can have like <laughs> debate about it which is what do you think uh, uh, what do you say about the faith of general public in the legal system justice delayed is just is denied so as i uh, said in the beginning that uh, there 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 is a huge gap in uh, in the dispensation of justice and uh, one of the endeavors which the chief justices of uh, of various high courts and the chief justices of india of the supreme court have been time and again talking is how to bridge that gap and they have identified technology and and i say rightly so they have identified technology as a medium which can which can narrow that gap and we see it ourselves you know we see it ourselves in lower courts yes uh, i think a lot of investments so india india has a lot of lawyers you know because for a long time law was a profession where you went because you did nothing else so you know you you went and became lawyer so we have huge number of lawyers not everyone unfortunately is competent or 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 efficient and i think uh, there is uh, uh, the bar council of india has also taken it up and they are conducting 
they are they have started some kind of filtration process in terms of conducting some kind of examinations for people to qualify as licensed practitioners so that at least basic understanding you know of laws is that because you'll be surprised in our, in our in our education system you can actually get a degree and not really know anything so i think it's evolving but i again uh, you know uh, it's uh, it's i would say it's, it is evolving and uh, it will it will improve i can't say uh, you know i can't give a finality to that but it will improve and uh, it see what is also happening is that because of uh, because of media because of the access because of the reach of the smartphones and the you know and the data people are are in know how of their rights a lot of people had predicted when i started my practice around in 2004 a lot of people had predicted that litigation is going to go down in supreme court a lot of senior counsels told me that at that time you know my seniors under whom i did my tutelage they said there's not much scope left for litigation but today litigation is as busy i mean my team is we work practically all we've been working practically all the weekends in the last 4 or 5 months you know so i think that is because people know their rights and uh, and 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 it cuts across the income groups you know so i think it's uh, it's i think with with technology they have better access what people want to see is a fair system what people want to see a faster system and i think technology can really really come in there and once that comes in that gap will really get bridged but it's but it's going to take time it's going to take time okay on that note we are getting close to the end of the time we've got about 3 minutes left but in i want uh, to give an opportunity anybody to kind of ask a live question or we'll move towards uh, the word of thanks from raj i have, i have a question sure the, the the panel has put forward like a grand vision about wide areas of legal structure and then challenges to catch up with kind of fast technology advancement but are there areas where you'd expect quick success with baby steps where keeping eye on the grand vision you mean in terms of opportunity debu uh, the the somebody starting a, a, a new enterprise which is which is a likelihood of quick success you mean in that so, so, so you break it down for your grand grand plan into smaller right. steps and do you see any of the areas where you can have quick success i can talk from my example our company is doing that our company is elevate services we call ourselves a law company not a law firm not a legal department and we are developing an elm uh, for corporations globally which is actually just streamlining all the activities happening within a corporate legal department it could be litigation compliance mna everything on one platform automating all aspects of that and combining that with the global service delivery which is having lawyers in different parts of the world working on that standardizing as deepika said it is really about supply chain you can actually choose and pick which part of the supply chain do you want to uh, break down and combine that using uh, uh, processes people and technology and there are so many of them so if you actually want to um, discuss that in detail because we don't have time we are i can give examples of exactly what we are doing you, you can go to our website as well but I'm, i'm sure there are many examples but there are real practical examples there are hundreds of companies um, um which are trying to do this globally um not so much in india right now but but it's a very active market um, in us specifically hundreds of legal tech companies which are trying to do it and combining that with services so it's a market which people have realized is ripe for change and disruption like any other part of the business and this has been left behind but people are coming to it now and there are real example and real companies which are doing this <clears throat> um i i i want to chip in here and you know the the oldest and the most traditional and still uh, which has a lot of scope is the contracts so uh, the way they are managed the way they are standardized the way they are deployed the way uh, things uh, happen around them uh, there's a lot of scope and contracts are very very diverse and you know different feed definitely a different kind of contract so for an easy answer that's the space uh, where you can really redeem but you know that takes time one question for you deepika probably the last question will take is is alternative uh, dispute resolution really bringing down litigation it is totally a mindset approach and i think you know um, it's it's always great because you know if in in the us there are certain uh, areas of uh, 
you know, work and, and like employment and, you know, there are certain things where you cannot really litigate. You only and only have to go for the arbitration and the arbitration and, you know, alternate dispute resolution. In my mind, ADR is one of the best tools available to reduce the litigation, to take off the burden of judiciary, go faster. Uh, in India, it's not so much so embraced, but in the ideal scenario, that's the way where you know parties can really sit with, with a with a ADR guy or a, a arbitrator and figure their priorities out and you know cut that chase instead of you know getting into the loop of you know a long litigation. So ideal answer in utopian world, yes, ADR is perfect for me. I think it's the way to go in my belief system, and it should bring the litigations down. I think I just want to add one thing to that. The courts have also been very proactive in India. In fact, the mediation is always encouraged, even in commercial transactions in Bombay. Uh, you, when you approach the courts, they, they to mediate and then come. But what I see is that the stubbornness of the parties. Mediation is not really doing as well as I thought it should have done. And that is because of stubbornness of parties. They all, you know, they say, no, we will go to the court and we'll fight. And uh, they are okay with the arbitration process. Uh, the arbitration process in India is uh, is being streamlined still, but I think in the next two three years we are we are going to reach there. There there uh, in 2016 there were amendments where it was made time bound, but uh, due to the pandemic, uh, which was finally enforced in I think 2017 16 17, uh, and things were looking bright where uh, the arbitration process was supposed to be completed within a specified period of time, and you could only take a few, uh, you, you could only get a few extensions. So that really helped. Uh, and I think in the next couple of years, that process also will streamline. And I think somebody had earlier asked a question as to when I see things will be better. And that's why I keep saying 2025, because I think a lot of these things will fall in place by then. And we will have a much, uh, much more robust, much more transparent, much, a much faster system by then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vikrant. We can't take any more questions because it's coming to the time end of the time. But if people, people have question, uh, pending questions, uh, we are on LinkedIn. You can reach out to uh, Pan IIT. They can direct the question. We'll uh, try to answer your question one to one. Uh, the, all the panels are on LinkedIn. Uh, you can connect and answer, ask the question or go through Pan IIT. But we'll make sure that we actually answer your question if there are any remaining questions or any future questions on this, this topic. Thank you uh, for uh, joining today. Uh, and we have more thanks from uh, Raj. <clears throat>